we wanted to ensure that it was placed within the policy so that, you know, this is uh, afforded to our families in recognition of any type of traditional cer ceremonies that they may want to um, uh, undertake at that specific location. Tonight, RCMP continued testimony before the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. I think we got to make a choice whether we're going to keep going down uh, this uh, Colonial Indian Act path. We speak with Miles Richardson, a candidate for National Chief for the Assembly of First Nations. We need to have non-Indigenous people also stand up for the land and waters, for their babies and for, the, uh, for all species to come. And renowned Métis artist Christy Belcourt brings uprisings to Thunder Bay. Good evening, I'm Melissa Ridgen. Testimony continued on Thursday at hearings for the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. The inquiry is in Regina till the end of this week, where they are hearing from police forces across Canada. The head of British Columbia's RCMP unit talked about new protocols officers must follow when dealing with homicide cases. How does the RCMP uh, deal with requests from families to see the site where their loved one may have passed? So I've actually had this uh, experience when I was in Prince George, we had, um, uh, we had to, uh, ide we identified a, a missing person with their remains and we were advising the family of the uh, homicide and, and obviously they're very emotional and they came from northern part of uh, British Columbia. So um, we facilitated their ability to come down to Prince George and then we took them to the, um, to the site after we obviously completed the investigation so that they could do their ceremony. And recognizing that this needed to be done consistently, we wanted to ensure that it was placed within the policy so that you know this is uh, afforded to our families in recognition of any type of traditional cer ceremonies that they may want to um, uh, undertake at that specific location. And is that reflected in the policy now? Yes, it is. The City of Montreal recently announced the return of human remains to the Mohawk community of Ganawage. The remains were found during construction of a new bridge over the St. Lawrence, and the mayor says the return is a step towards reconciliation with Indigenous people. Danielle Rochette reports. For years, Chief Christian Zachary de Homme has been working to get Mohawk remains returned so they can be led to rest. I've been working so long on it that I feel almost as old as the remains, but also I felt so overwhelmed as a result when they said they would do that because it has been up and down for us on this topic. Over the last decade, many excavations have occurred on the island of Montreal due to new construction and restorations. Archaeologists and their students found thousands of fragments of pottery, pipes and arrowheads. But for McGill archaeologist Jennifer Bracewell, it was the first time she dug up historic human remains. I've learned so much. I've learned a lot about um, the uh, Mohawk worldview. Um, and I feel like I have a much better understanding now of just why this is so important to the community. The city of Montreal agreed to return the remains from six graves dating back 2,000 to 4,000 years. In a press release, Mayor Valérie Plante said, we are sensitive to this request and we recognize their legitimacy when it is planned to begin the process. The community of Kanawagi already set aside land for the historic remains in an old Catholic cemetery, right in the middle of the town of Kanawagi. So that there will be this portion here, just along the strip, a small area to rebury uh, whether the skulls and the, and the skeletons, that's where they will be placed. The remains should be respected and they finally have their right to be where they should be. Yanawagi hopes that other First Nations will be inspired by their efforts and success in getting back the remains of their ancestors. Daniel Rochette, EPTN National News, Yanawagi, Quebec. We now have a tragic update for you in a missing persons case out of Alberta. The remains of 44-year-old Gloria Gladue have been found in Manitoba. Glad you disappeared from the Wabasca area some 300 kilometers north of Edmonton back in October 2015. 
Alberta RCMP have charged Grant Arthur Sneesby of Gladstone, Manitoba with second-degree murder and offering an indignity to her remains. Police say Gladys remains were found in a rural Manitoba area on June 17th. Sneesby is expected to make his first court appearance on July 12th. We will continue to work on this breaking story. And we would like to hear what you have to say about this or any other story. Here's how you can contact us. Send us an email to news at aptn.ca. Like our APTN National News Facebook page. Follow us on Twitter at APTN News or go to our website, aptnnews.ca. Five years ago, a major flood forced the Siksika Nation, located east of Calgary, to declare a state of emergency. The flood of 2013 destroyed about 200 homes and forced thousands of people to evacuate. Five years later, not much has improved, some say. Tamara Pimentel has the story. It's been a long five years since Mark Wolfleg and his wife, Donalda Youngman, moved into this temporary home. Uh, we're just like in limbo here. We can't live. Like how we want to live, like how anybody else lives. Their house was one of hundreds destroyed in 2013 when the Bow River overflowed and washed out this area of Siksika First Nation. Today, those houses have yet to be built. High River and you know all of these places have all their homes. You know right away they got help. Us Siksikas, we're still waiting. Still waiting for a place to call home while the band continues to work at rebuilding its community. There's those challenges, water, infrastructure, um, utility companies took a lot longer. Um, you know, sometimes up to two years to get power installed at some sites. There are roughly 400 people on the waiting list. Siksika property manager Marilyn Little Chief says those misplaced shouldn't have to wait much longer. The majority of them, I'm thinking probably within a couple of weeks, they should be all moved home. That's what I'm hoping. But Wolfleg says he isn't keeping his hopes up. As resilient as we are, we just, uh, we strive to, to keep going. And that's what uh, we look at our children and that's what keeps us going. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. After five years, the Nietzsche Commons food store in North Winnipeg is closing its doors tomorrow. The beleaguered co-op opened its Main Street location amid much fanfare five years ago. The state-of-the-art building housed a restaurant, an art store, a bakery, a grocery store, an office space. The restaurant was forced to close this past winter. The building was mortgaged by the Assiniboine Credit Union, and the credit union put the building up for sale a year ago. So far, it hasn't sold. We'll have more on this story for you in the coming days. Well, we have to go to a break, but we will be uh, back right after the weather starting out on the East Coast. Rain in PEI in Nova Scotia, 21 in Charlottetown, 18 in Halifax. Kujawak and Nain are looking at seven with cloud. Cloud in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, but 23. A mix of sun and cloud in central Quebec, 28th for St. Jovet, uh, Quebec City and Montreal. A string of sunshine and near 30 temperatures for much of southern Ontario, but rain in North Bay and Sault Ste. Marie. Rain too for much of northwestern Ontario, 25 in Wawa, 17 in Thunder Bay. In Manitoba, a sun and cloud in 23 is for Flin Flon, the Paw, Norway House. Partly sunny in 25 for both Barrens River and Winnipeg, 28 in rain in Gimli Harbour. To Saskatchewan, milder temperatures, cloud and some rain in 20 in Swift Current, 19 in Regina. Northern Saskatchewan is a mix of sun and cloud, 18 in Uranium City and Buffalo Narrows, 20 on Meadow Lake and Mirage. Five candidates are taking a run at the Assembly of First Nations National Chief job. APTN is chatting with each candidate to find out why they're running, and today we spoke with Miles Richardson. Thanks for joining us. Can you tell me why you've decided to run for National Chief? I think our people, our Indigenous people across this country have been in a crisis, uh, quite an increasingly acute crisis with this Colonial Indian Act system that we've been trying to find our way out from under. And I think now is, a, is an opportunity, now is a time to step forward. And I think we've got to make a choice 
whether we're going to keep going down the, this uh, Colonial Indian Act path or whether we're going to choose, which isn't working for us, or whether we're going to choose a new direction. And I believe we ought, I'm running and standing because I believe we need to choose a new direction. And I believe we need to stand up in na as nations and assert our authorities, assert our titles, our treaties, our jurisdictions to, and in the process, develop a, a new equal relationship with the country of Canada on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. And in, in a nutshell, that's why I'm running. I think that my experience, all of uh, what I've done throughout my career has prepared me for such an initiative, and I think it's the only way forward. How do you think you can get out from under the Indian Act system, though? I mean, that alone is, where do you even begin with that? Well, that's the question, isn't it? The first thing is our people have to make a choice. Our people have to believe in who we know we are. Each of us across this country, from coast to coast to coast, are the living generations of ancient nations, nations that have thrived in this, these lands we now call Canada for millennia. You know, the last 150 years, the last 300 years has been a blip in the lifetime of our people. Our story is our nationhood with its deep roots. This colonial system is a little over 150 years old. We need to step out from it. It's obvious that the government of Canada is not going to lead the way. They pay lip service to it every day. But the only way to move out of it is for our people to make a choice to do that, to stand up and have some confidence in ourselves. Have pride in who we are as peoples, in our own histories, and tell our own stories, and well, stand in our own power. Do you think that the situation with Canada has improved in the last four years, like since the last uh, AFN election for national chief? Has it improved? No. Got worse? No. Same? It, uh, it's, it's a crisis. I mean, I don't know how much worse it could get. Look at the situation that we're looking at with missing and mi murdered indigenous women and girls. Look at the court system. Every time one of our people gets killed and shot by some homesteader, they get away with it. You know, you look at the situation of water in our, it, this is Canada. Imagine how many indigenous peoples don't even have clean drinking water. I mean, I don't know how much more of a crisis it could get, and that didn't just happen in the last four years, and it hasn't improved in the last four years. Well, and know, it's not going to improve. You've, you've it's not going to improve until we stand up. There's uh, the points that you raise are valid, and these are things that a lot of people are saying. But I guess the question then goes to how would AFN be able to change any of this? A lot of people say uh, that AFN is no longer relevant, and you're saying AFN needs to take a lead in these things. Can you explain? Well, I, one thing I'd ask you and your listeners to do is look at my history. Look at who I am and what I've done in my career. I've been a leader of my people, of the Haida Nation, who built alliances with, with uh, nations on, in this part of the world to try and rectify this situation, to attempt to build a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Canada. It hasn't worked. You know, 20 years ago, we established a treaty process in British Columbia that was heralded in much the same way as we're talking about nation to nation today. The Crown did not change its intention. The Crown did not change its policy toward relationships with us. They continued the colonial path of trying to deny, 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 even our existence as human beings, as human societies, let alone humans with rights. And they're getting away with it, and we can't let them. The stakes are too high. Okay. And I think we got to, each of our nations needs to define themselves in a modern way and stand up and assert who they are, stand up and assert their own title, their own rights in their own territory. And we need to stand together to accomplish that. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's the Assembly of First Nations role to do that. It is not. The Assembly of First Nations is not a government and must not act like one. Our nations have their own governments. The Assembly of First Nations must be a force for joining, a force for building alliances amongst Indigenous people across this country 
And that's the way we're going to turn this mess around. I thank you so much for taking time to join us and share your views on this very important topic with us. Thank you. There have been some big developments in the National 60 Scoop Settlement. APTN's Kathleen Martins has been reporting on this issue for our website, aptnnews.ca. She's here now to bring our television audience up to speed. Okay, Kathleen, where is the settlement at now? Yeah, you know what, it's in limbo, which is bad news. Survivors have been waiting for this to get settled, and instead now they, there's a whole bunch of question marks around it. Uh, a judge decided last week he liked two-thirds of it. He loved the $750 million for survivors, the $50 million to create a healing foundation. He thought, great idea, but then there's $75 million for lawyers' fees he couldn't approve that. And what's the problem then with the lawyer's fees? Right. You know, normally in these big class action, these big settlements, those fees are percentage mm -hmm. and they're generally just approved and away we go. This time, like two judges are looking at two levels, federal and provincial. Mm -hmm. Federal judges signed off. Provincial judges say, uh, 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 wait. He says, um, some of these law firms were working on this much longer than some of the others. The ones who were in from the beginning deserve the fees. The ones are the late Johnny come lately? Mm -hmm. No, it's too much. They should get paid by the amount of time they invested. This is a brand new approach to doing these settlement things. Well, and this hasn't been the first time there's been problems with lawyers involved in these types of settlements. So it's interesting that we're even having this discussion then. So, but what does it mean? What does this discussion mean kind of going forward? Okay, so, so what it means is everything's on hold and survivors are very unhappy about that. So the judge asked the lawyers, can you guys split your fees? That means the settlement can go ahead without the lawyer fee part and then you guys can meet with judge separately and we'll try to hash out come to an agreement on how much you should be paid but he's like that's too much money uh, the lawyers though only two of them have agreed two firms say yeah three firms say no so we've got uh, kind of a standoff and so the three that say no um, what's why wouldn't they just go along with this new well, method of getting paid. Well, I think it's going to set a precedent for going forward, and that means anybody who, any firms that come in l later, even bringing in a big group of, of claimants, could be affected. Their fees could be affected, and they don't feel it's necessary because there's two levels mm -hmm. of courts here one's federal, one's provincial. The ones in the provincial arena are like, this is fine with us. Let the survivors go ahead and, and let's get the settlement going. The ones that are dealing in the federal arena are like, no, that judge in provincial, he doesn't have jurisdiction over us. He shouldn't be making any decisions about how much we get paid. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of been left now that, um, and, and Canada, like the federal minister involved, Carolyn Bennett, she agrees. She's like, you guys split your fees out of the settlement and let's let it go ahead. And they call that delinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, like I say, the two say yes, three say no. So the minister and the survivors want the lawyers to do this delinking. Mm -hmm. But uh, these firms so far are holding fast. Mm -hmm. um, although I have heard that uh, they're going to meet with the federal judge very soon to see if he can maybe get this impasse cleared up. I think everybody wants it to go forward, yeah. uh, but um, you know, we're going to see. It's very interesting. So we will see. And we'll have you back to explain how it all shakes down. Thank okay. you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Time for more weather and then a short break. But stick with us because we have more news to come. Mix of sun and cloud in northern Alberta, 19 in high level, Peace River and Fort McMurray. Same further south, uh, 22 in Edmonton, 19 in Red Deer, but rain in Calgary at 18. We've got warmth in the interior, 25 for Kamloops and Penticton, 16 in Port Hardy and Tofino on the coast. 16 and some sun in Dees Lake, 18 in Smithers, 20 in Prince George. Cloud and 13 in Rock River, 20 in Cloud in Dawson City and Cloud and Watson Lake. Quite a bit of sun for the Northwest Territories, 19 in Norman Wells, 20 in Throat Lake. Sachs Harbor is going to be 10, Colville Lake 13, and 17 in Deline, 11 in Baker Lake, Whale Cove, 8 in Aravia, Air Arivat, and lots of sunshine for those communities. Same in Resolute and 8, but over in Iqaluit, rain and only 5 degrees.
Christy Bellacourt is known around the world for her signature dot painting art. Her latest exhibition landed in Thunder Bay. APTN's Willow Fiddler brings us a look into the exhibit. The Thunder Bay Art Gallery has been hit with an uprising. That's the name of Christy Belcourt's latest exhibition, a retrospective collaboration with Isaac Murdoch. There's an urgent message they want the world to see and hear in their art. Uh, not enough people are active in trying to um, do things for the earth and oppose pipelines and stand up for the earth and for the waters. I think when I hear the word uprising, I see something amazing and beautiful. I see Indigenous people coming together and really, you know, standing strong and, and united for Mother Earth. And if there was ever a time when we needed to do this, it would be right now. Belcourt is a world-renowned Métis artist famous for her stunning dot paintings. Murdoch started working with her a few years ago. His image, Thunderbird Woman, has become symbolic, particularly on the front lines of resistant movements. These are nations of people that are saying, no, you cannot destroy our lands. There's, there, there's a difference between a protest and nations standing up and saying, we're going to protect our lands and waters for future generations. Murdoch praises Belcourt for her ability to capture the land and water in her paintings. Christie's <laughs> art has a way of explaining uh, you know, how ecosystems work, why biospheres are so delicate, and how we're all connected to everything. My inspiration comes from the land. The land is the, the earth is our best teacher. It's, it's, it's my government. It's my teacher. It's my school. It's my everything. Belcourt hopes the exhibition unites people to stand up together and take action. Like water has no race. Water has no flag. And we, we need to have non-Indigenous people also stand up for the land and waters for their babies and for, the, for all species to come. She says hope is in the children and future generations. This grade one class from St. Martin's School visited the exhibition on its opening day. How important is water to you? Um, very important. How come? Because um, it gives you from, for not being dry and it helps the land. Why do we need water? Because you drink water and fishes also need it because they need to swim in it. What was your favorite part so far? This, this one. What do you like about it? Because I like spiders and it's, and I thought that it had really lots of details and colors. But young people are so flexible and they, you know, there's they have all this simple wisdom. You know, they have the answers. But we maybe we should be following them. <laughs> yeah, I think they're actually the teachers, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Uprising, the power of Mother Earth, will be showing until November. Willow Fiddler, APTN National News, Thunder Bay. It's Mars like you've never seen it before. Italy's space agency has released the first ever 3D color video of the planet's surface. The images were captured by a space probe orbiting 400 kilometers above Mars. Italy's space agency says the video is real and it isn't digitally modified. It was captured by a special high-resolution imaging system. That is all the news we have for you this Thursday, June 28th. Come back tomorrow and we'll have more. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night.